Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Dunduale. It's our pleasure to have you with us today. National security or insecurity remains at the forefront of national discussions in Nigeria, especially in view of continuing incidents which highlight vulnerabilities. My guest on the program today believes that the work of regional security outfits like Amoteko in the Southwest has been positive in tackling insecurity in the region. My guest also thinks that more personnel are needed in intelligence gathering agencies, but that this must be properly budgeted for and funds provided. Newsnight talks to retired director of the Department of State Services, the DSS, and foremost intelligence expert, Mr. Mike Ejofo. Mr. Ejofo, thank you for being with us. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Let's, uh, let us uh, begin from uh, some of the more recent happenings uh, and use them as a peg uh, to look at our current uh, security situation. There was the uh, guards attack, uh, that is the attack on the brigade of guards. Uh, before that, uh, there was the uh, uh, attack on the Kujay prisons. Uh, and then after that, there have been some uh, incidents that have happened uh, at the Ajaokuta train station and then the DSS capture of uh, self-confessed uh, Boko Haram insurgents who traveled all the way from the northern part to Ijaye in uh, Ogun State, uh, where uh, he was then, on the base of intelligence, arrested. Uh, and uh, from the reports we are receiving, uh, some of the information he has given already indicates that there are others like him uh, who have moved to different parts of the country from what had been their traditional basis. What do you make of all of this uh, as a peg for our uh, security situation? Well, it's quite uh, disturbing and uh, gives real cause for concern for everywhere in Nigeria that uh, these bandits or terrorists, whatever you call them, are all over the country wreaking havoc. Uh, take, for instance, the, like you said, the Kuji correctional facility that was attacked. And that one is really disturbing because uh, the intention was to actually release their colleagues, you know, who are terrorists in that. And they succeeded in doing that. Uh, the attack on the, the Brigade of Guards, I would say, was not uh, targeted, you know, because these people went into for a rescue and uh, ran into an ambush. So it wasn't, a, I would say, a deliberate uh, attack on the Brigade of Guards. But um, it's worrisome that the Brigade of Guard was attacked. And we have some isolated uh, attacks and uh, cases that is really disturbing. Um, I think the Nigeria Railway Corporation, if I'm right, has also corrected the issue of uh, Ajokuta that they have not suspended the, the transportation system within that axis. But it also, also calls for concerned that people should be worried, you know, in terms of what's going on. Um, overall, I'm happy that the intelligence uh, agency, the state security service, have been on top of the game, you know, compiling this intelligence. Uh, but the most important issue we should be asking, what has come of this intelligence? Because that any is the, intelligence that is the, the, that uh, is the question. government. My apologies for interrupting, but that is the question, because I know that uh, the Deputy Speaker of the House uh, of Representatives uh, was quoted as saying that uh, the intelligence agencies uh, had produced at least 44 reports uh, on this attack uh, on Kujay prisons, and yet uh, nothing, at least nothing visible, was done before the uh, attack took place. So I'm now putting the question to you, what is the process uh, by which actionable intelligence or intelligence gets translated from report form into operation uh, uh, to act on the basis of that intelligence? Well, uh, intelligence is uh, normally distributed on the basis of need to know. You know, uh, if uh, the SSS has intelligence bordering on uh, internal security or breach of the peace, they normally send such reports to the various uh, agents, especially the police, the military, uh, the Office of the National Security Advisor. Of course, 
the president is a major recipient of such uh, intelligence. And uh, when they are gotten, like somebody asked me in one of these uh, news uh, outlets too, you know, you don't have to wait for the president to give a directive on such imminent attacks. It is expected that the, the recipient, like the military or the police, takes immediate action. But the question is, do they have the capacity to deal with this situation? Uh, in terms of capacity, let's take um, the correctional facilities, for instance. The minister came out, and the full glare of the public, a facility that, like that, you know, a medium uh, uh, security platform like that, you don't have cameras. Cameras definitely would not prevent people from, uh, you know, committing havoc, but at least it will assist in investigation after the occurrence of an uh, incident. And uh, you look at the movement of these people, they move in hundreds. Uh, I was just uh, reading one of the social media that uh, people, you know, you do 20, 10 kilometers, you have more than two check, 10 checkpoints, you know, police look at, and these people hardly meet checkpoints. So what is responsible? How is it that they, they just move freely without the checkpoints? Or could it be that uh, when, well, because they are ill-equipped, they are not as armed as these uh, bandits, uh, once they see them, they run away and they, they don't interrogate them. These are issues that should be interrogated to know exactly what's going on. Uh, the police is ill-equipped. That is obvious. Uh, the military is not uh, equally equipped as they should be. Uh, we should be relying more, not on the normal, despite the fact that there's a shortage in strength of the police and the military. We should rely more on technology now. I, I'll give another example. If um, perhaps the bandits are moving in their motorbikes and uh, in hundreds, as they claim, uh, I have not seen them. And you, you, you see them, if you have effective drones, and you see them from uh, afar, one of the most rational things to do is to call for area backup, you know, get these people bombed before they, they come to kidnap people. But once they kidnap, it becomes very difficult for you to handle them because of uh, collateral damage. You endanger the lives of the victims in the process of trying to rescue them. So we should rely more on technology. Another example I'll give, for instance, you recall when that American was uh, kidnapped in Niger and yes. brought to Nigeria. America deployed all the technologies and directly attacked the bandits, killed six of them, and rescued the bandits. We also are aware of this uh, al Zanawi that was uh, targeted, and so we should rely more on technology. We don't have the technology, so we should now collaborate and uh, synergize with uh, donor agencies and other countries that can be of assistance to us. Uh, because the situation has become, uh, as some would describe it, seemingly more critical, uh, there, there are some of the sub-national uh, and indeed other uh, uh, bodies uh, who are trying uh, to advocate or in some cases implementing, trying to implement uh, uh, some measure of security steps, uh, as it were, to secure the citizens. Uh, that is the objective. You remember that, uh, of course, the Zamfara state government uh, did the much publicized asking of its citizens to come forward uh, to be licensed to uh, carry weapons in self-defense. Uh, much more recently, uh, you have the case of uh, in Benway State saying that uh, the state government was going to uh, uh, purchase AK-47, 48 and 49 rifles uh, for their community guards, which were just uh, inaugurated. And then there are others who are saying, you mentioned it when you were talking, when you talked about bikes, motorbikes, being the preferred mode of transport of the, uh, of the bandits and terrorists, a nationwide ban uh, on the use of motorbikes, so that if we see anybody on motorbikes, uh, we, are, we are likely to presume that uh, until proven otherwise, then you have ill intentions. Are these, in your view, positive moves? Well, uh, if you look at uh, the establishment of various uh, security outfits locally, yeah, that's commendable. But uh, uh, like uh, Governor of Benue threatened to 
by uh, uh, AK-47, AK-49 to arm his... Uh, I don't think that's within the law. But any means anybody can use to protect himself, like government has been calling on people to protect themselves. I'll give you an example of um, the Amoteku. You know, since the establishment, I think it's the most organized in all, all parts of the country, the Amoteku, because they have achieved a lot of success, especially in Ondo State. You know, until recently, when we had this uh, attack on the Catholic Church, Ondo State remained, uh, remained uh, you see, uh, relatively peaceful. And uh, I think that's the way to go, that we should involve not only the security outfits, but the community, the people should be involved, you know, giving information to the, to the security agencies when you say, say something, say something. But on the issue of uh, ban on motorbike, I don't agree with that. I'm also happy that it's a proposal from on the side of government to see how it will work. If you ban motorcycle as a means of transport, don't also forget that within some communities, motorbikes are only means of uh, transportation. Uh, but in areas where they, have, they are very well known, you know, like Zamfara and uh, Kassina, all these areas, yes, we can give it a try of uh, maybe one mode ban to see whether there's going to be a difference. Because if you make a general ban all over the country, you have thrown a lot of people out of job. Some graduates are engaged in uh, this uh, Okada riding. If you throw them out, so you throw them out to, into the, the field again, as swelling the, the uh, number of uh, criminals in the society. So a general ban, for me, is not, should not be considered. You look at areas, maybe give them how to operate, get identification tax, so that anybody have a reflection uh, tax you see that these people are genuinely registered with bold numbers so that any time you see such a person, you should be able to. And before you register, you must have your vehicle particulars, motorbike particulars. Most of these bikes being used by bandits are not registered. And uh, they just move about. If you see people are on the street, so I am suggesting that if we must uh, what I'm suggesting that we must regulate instead of an outright ban, especially in uh, urban areas, community, in the rural communities, where you have it as only means of transport. You get them registered, give them reflective vex with bold numbers so that you can easily identify who and who is involved in it. So that's my view on that. Let's, uh, let, let's come back to the issue of intelligence where we started. A lot of people, uh, and you are involved, of course, have, uh, 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 having been uh, a very senior officer of the DSS, Nigeria has uh, a plethora of uh, intelligence agencies, apart from the DSS, which is probably the most uh, famous one or the most public face of intelligence in the country. All the armed services have their own intelligence arm. You have Army Intelligence, Navy Intelligence, Air Force Intelligence. You have the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, then you have other subordinate bodies like the Security and Civil Defense Corps and so on, who are, whose jobs are also primarily intelligence. The question, therefore, is at what level are they coordinating all this gathering of intelligence? Are they, for example, all submitting them to the DSS, which then makes it into one report for action? Or is it that it's the office of the NSA? Because many people say with all these agencies producing intelligence, and we have no doubt now that they are producing intelligence, what is happening to the intelligence thus produced? Yeah, a good question. You know, I'll give you a little background on that. You recall that uh, decree number 19 of uh, 1986, uh, established by the Demba Bangeda regime, where you had the sole body, the sole uh, organization, Nigeria Security Organization, which was fully in charge of uh, intelligence, including military, non-military, general intelligence. But uh, when uh, Bangeda came, 
he promulgated that decree and dissolved the, the NSO, forming three security intelligence services. The National Intelligence Agency, which is uh, involved in uh, external and counterintelligence. You have uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is also the, uh, military, involving all the military. And you have uh, the State Security Service, which is the internal security charged with uh, maintenance of uh, law and order by gathering, is the sole body uh, charged with uh, gathering of intelligence in the country, you know, uh, to avoid crimes against the state. With the NSA coordinating, that is National Security Advisor, you have it under the National Security Act. So this is the three major uh, uh, institutions established for intelligence gathering in the country. Now, within the various services, the Army, the Navy, the police, they have their intelligence uh, outfit. Like, you don't expect the SSS. The SSS, for instance, is charged with crime against the state. We don't, it's not that they don't have information also bordering on crime against individuals, which they can collate and forward to the police for action. But police also has its own intelligence involving general crime. The uh, national, the Nigerian army has its own intelligence charged with uh, maintenance of uh, its own, uh, maybe in combat and uh, fighting. The same thing with the Air Force, you know. But they're all expected to collaborate and uh, work together. And uh, I think the world over is not peculiar to Nigeria. There have been this rivalry, but I think the issue of rivalry among the agencies have been streamlined. They're working more closely at least at the leadership level. And so we don't have uh, those uh, issues, except in the field where you have uh, the younger officers that uh, uh, tend to you know, promote this rivalry. But overall, I think there's a, a, a very good understanding among the leadership of the, and so that is why we say that it's not that the State Security Service, for instance, is not uh, providing the intelligence. But the other action agencies don't have capacity to deal with this situation. I am also happy that the president, I don't know what that meant anyway, when the president said that he has given them full uh, free hand to operate. Does that suggest that the president was restricting them somehow? So we will wait, we will wait to see, since they, are, they have been given timeline, we think we to bring this uh, situation under control coupled with the threat by the National Assembly to impeach the president. So I believe that we should be able to have a difference, in, maybe in terms of result, approach, and the tactics. We, we tend to emphasize when there's either intelligence failure or operational failure. That's the accusation, that uh, very often even the agencies that are involved don't bring to light the successes that they have. I remember uh, one of the former uh, uh, defense chiefs uh, talking about the fact that if there were 10 incidents and eight of them were successes and only two were failures, it is the two that were uh, not successful or that were failures that get emphasized both by the media and by the public. Whereas the eight that were successful uh, are not talked about at all. Most recently, and I referenced that at the start of this interview when I talked about the intelligence result in uh, Abe Okuta in uh, Ogun State, where uh, a Boko Haram commander, a self-confessed Boko Haram commander, was arrested following intelligence by the DSS. But the DSS uh, refused to confirm, even as we speak today, they refused to confirm or deny that that happened, and, um, or, or how they went about it, or who... Uh, uh, the information uh, is about and what he told them would be where the others were so that the public could be of help. Is there a problem here between ensuring that intelligence gathering remains confidential and secret and also involving the public, including the media, in ensuring that such intelligence is actionable and that people are able to help the intelligence agencies gather even more information that could help tackle insecurity? Now, uh, the chief uh, of defense who made uh, uh, 
uh, they remark that uh, when uh, you succeed in eight and there's a failure in two, I completely agree with him. Because even in football in Nigeria, when we are winning, everybody is shouting. But once we lose one game, everybody becomes a coach. And they uh, begin to criticize, to say they should have done it this way. People who don't even have security background will continue to come and give you advice on what should have been done or what shouldn't have been done. Now, having said that, I believe that uh, there must be synergy between the members of the public and uh, the, the security agencies. The security agencies are not magicians. If you recall that, you see, and the press, the media also needs to be involved. You know, if the SSS, for instance, has not issued a statement on its successes, and it comes in the public domain, and they go about it, you know, blowing up that proportion, you are going to definitely uh, compromise the outcome of that investigation because people who are there will be in a position to say, well, since this is the other ones will be on the run. So it's not everything, especially matters under investigation, should be protected, you know, by the media. And I believe uh, the state security service management also have, on several occasions, had interactions with uh, media executives to talk to the media on what and what not to report. We should be able to filter what is of national interest instead of looking at sensational headlines where you think you can make and sell papers. You see, the, 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 to get matters compounded and complex now, the social media is not helping matters. They come up with all kinds of stories. So I, for one, you know, the SSS hardly comes out to speak. And I'm not speaking for the SSS. But because of my experience that I had while I was in the service, that every time there's an incident, the SSS will be blamed. So I decided to take it upon myself, you know, to enlighten and educate members of the public on their roles to the country, to the service, and the responsibilities and functions of the state security service. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think it's a huge result because every day I'm called upon to come and discuss, come and discuss this. I don't speak for the SSS, but uh, at least we need to enlighten members of the public. You reference the fact that um, the 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 bandits, the terrorists, sometimes appear to be uh, better armed than some of our own uh, security agencies. And I'm wondering uh, how that could happen or how that could have happened. Because, I mean, we're talking about groups here which are mostly ragtag, uh, small, small groupings here and there with a few uh, sponsors, uh, both within and outside the country, as we're told. And then you are, we're comparing those with uh, the DSS, the Army, the Nigerian Army, the Nigerian Air Force, and so on. Uh, and so people will ask the question, how is it possible for these people to be better armed than our own forces? Uh, uh, so I, I want to ask you, uh, given your background and your experience, how that is possible and more importantly, what do we then do to reverse it uh, uh, in our favor? You know, it's not possible that they will be better armed than the, the Nigerian military. I know that the world over, in fact, the last rating, I know the position the Nigerian military uh, had, you know, in terms of uh, performance all over the world. If, uh, I'm not aware, too, that... Uh, these bandits or terrorists have airports. I'm not aware they have any aircraft that, uh, so, and you know the cost of aircraft. But the truth remains that these people have no rules of engagement. They operate anyhow. And if Nigeria Air Force, for instance, goes to bomb it, the international community will begin to shout, Nigeria is abusing human rights, we are doing this, we are doing this. So we are guided by rules and regulations, by standard operating procedures. But these people don't. A, a situation where you see uh, a train and you open fire and kidnap people. Can the Nigerian military do that? And you see uh, they have brought down an aircraft. It's because they have no rules of engagement. 
Uh, it's not that they, they and they have free free access to arms that they can use. The military must account for its own uh, stock. It must account for what they use. But like I said earlier, the president has said he has given them full free hand to operate. So let us see how he's going to change the situation. But that they are better armed, I don't agree with that. One of the things that uh, enables them to do all the things that they do is finance, uh, whether it be in small quantities or in large quantities. And there are many people who have pointed to examples elsewhere uh, where the question of finance and how to interrupt the financial flow uh, uh, to these kind of uh, groups happens, uh, uh, how it can be done. But against the background that, you know, they are collecting ransoms uh, for kidnapping people. And these ransoms sometimes are in millions, hundreds of millions, tens of millions. The, the conduits are on two sides. They get funding from outside, and then they get funding from their activities inside. How do we interrupt this? Well, I believe that the security agencies, especially the intelligence outfit, the state security, are making uh, arrests, at least on the uh, funding, intercepting the... the it, it, go, it goes down to what... goes back to what you earlier said. The SSS, the military, cannot come out to tell you the number of arrests that have been made. They won't tell you the sources of funds they have blocked. The EFCC is on, uh, 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 in that place, except when the investigations are concluded before they can now say, OK, we are going for prosecution. That's the only time you hear of what is going on. Otherwise, every other thing is behind the scene. Now, these people have access to fund, and they buy their arms through black market. They are not regulated, and they just do whatever they like. It's a problem, and I believe that soon, by the grace of God, we shall overcome these uh, challenges, as, especially as we are now going into election. Don't also forget that these are people who don't believe in democracy. So their activities tend to uh, be up now because they want to disrupt the process. They say Western education is uh, forbidden, Boko Haram, for instance, and uh, they feel they are succeeding because schools have closed. and not closed just because of uh, schools have remained closed because on the part of government, they've not been able to resolve uh, a su crisis. So they seem to be succeeding. So that's why government should take the initiative from them and ensure the ASU matter is resolved, takes uh, care of the security situation, and we're back on course again. But you know that in the Southeast, uh, Mr. Ejofo, the problem is completely different uh, from other parts of the country. In the Southeast, we had the ideological group which is uh, fighting for Biafra uh, or the tenants of Biafra on the IPOB and that had spiraled into the Monday stay at home and attacks on uh, prominent personalities and those who have tried to get people to defy that stay at home. What can you tell me about what has subsequently happened in that case? Because it also seems as if that too is degenerating into some form of criminality. Um, uh, unfortunately, yeah, like you rightly pointed out, the situation in the southeast is uh, different from other parts of the country. That is purely political. And I've always maintained that it requires a political solution. Government should look, a, look for a way of resolving these things politically. But ironically, some of the criminals have come under the agitation of IPOB to uh, see what we now, the emergence of what we call uh, unknown government, uh, criminals hiding under the cloak of the agitation. Over, I believe that the governor of um, Anambra State has also taken the initiative to fish out the criminal elements and uh, uh, return sanity to, to the state. I also believe, especially in Imo, where they operate freely, uh, for them, to, for the government to also take the same initiative. Possibly infiltrate these people, dialogue with them, and see that is for the agitators. And let them also assist in fishing out the criminal elements who are not representing their interests. Because definitely I don't believe that the IPOB is responsible for the killings in the Southeast. How about the South-South? South-South for now is relatively um, 
useful, but uh, I hope the government also takes the initiative to maintain that relative peace that we're enjoying there. I'll give you an example. Uh, for instance, there have been agitation over the con uh, reconstitution of the board of the NDDC. Whether they are working or not working is a different ball game. But let that board be in place because that's what the, the people are asking for. And uh, they have given in, uh, indications that they might likely go back to the creeks. There's a, I saw um, a video clip of uh, Asari Dokuba, for instance, you know, because there's, we're approaching virtually a complete breakdown of law and order, people cannot now parade. I, I, I will not support Asari Dokuba for that, and I will, also, I will not also blame him. You take, for instance, the government has, the government in Kaduna, Kasena, Zafara, have been fraternizing with these bandits where they openly display their arms. So what does that tell you? We need to sanitize our polity, especially as we approach, uh, approach uh, campaign periods. Do you have a fear that uh, politics, uh, the, uh, the fact that, and you referenced it where you talked about the fact that we are approaching elections, so a lot of people are uh, getting agitated. Do you think that approach to politics is also diverting attention away from this fight <coughs> against insecurity? Uh, do you think that perhaps uh, it's also timeless that the challenges are reaching some kind of crescendo as we are approaching the political season? Yeah, we are, we, yes, uh, we, we should be expecting uh, an upsurge in such uh, tendencies. Because, uh, first of all, we are contending with uh, agitation, terrorism, banditry, and so on and so forth. Politicians will come up with their own problems in the bid to capture votes. You can see what is happening now, the utterances. We have inter and intra political squabbles, and these are going to uh, heat up the polity and possibly bring uh, some challenges, security challenges. But I believe that our security agencies too must be up on their game. When you, when you talked about um, arms, one of the things that occurred were, uh, to anyone who is listening to you would be that that talks about our borders. And you also have security agencies at our borders. Um, and that is how these possibilities uh, could, uh, uh, could bring themselves to reality. So I ask about international collaboration. We're supposed to have a multinational joint task force in Chad. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was so much noise made uh, about the fact that Nigeria uh, bought vehicles uh, for Niger Republic, which uh, some of the reports I've heard indicate that some of those vehicles are to be used for patrols uh, at the border uh, between uh, Nigeria and uh, Niger. Uh, so, how do you think these international collaboration efforts are going and how much effect are they having on the fight against uh, insecurity? Well, I'm not aware that those vehicles were donated for patrol. Uh, if they were donated for, I don't think that's the best uh, aspect of them. So, I'm not uh, totally in support of that. But don't also forget that Nigeria has been looked up to as a big brother. Being a big brother, we have our own challenges. You don't carry elephant on the head and begin to use your leg to dig cricket. We, we, we have more than enough problem. We have not been able to settle the issue of ASU. Government is finding it very difficult to pay salary. And yet we have one point uh, something billion given, used in buying this vehicle. We would have assisted our security agencies. And if we must give, why don't we go to Innocent that has been exporting vehicles and bring our own uh, uh, product uh, help the industry grow by sending the, our own vehicles manufactured in Nigeria to all these people. So I think that's a complete waste. The government knows why it did that and they have liberty to explain to Nigeria. Yeah, so the, the point I'm making is that our borders are porous and that is responsible for the inflow of uh, illegal arms, you know, into the country.
they are not manned. You where they are manned, you see some compromises to among our security agencies who we'll could collaborate with them and allow them to, to get in these arms freely. Uh, so it's a very big challenge. And uh, it, it comes back to what I said, that we need to em employ more technology because there's no way you can man the borders by human beings. They're so vast and they, you have a lot of uh, illegal routes that can no man. But if we use aerial uh, surveillance, I think it will, it, will, it will help us to check the inflow of arms, which is a major source of threat to our national security. How do you, how do you uh, propose, how do you think that we can bridge the trust gap? Earlier in the interview, you talked about the fact that the public also needs to be uh, strongly in support of the various security agencies, particularly by providing them with information uh, uh, that could lead to actionable intelligence and that could help foil plots or lead to uh, 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 stoppage of uh, security incidents. But as we both know, you and I, we know that uh, people are very reluctant to approach security agencies because they say they don't want to themselves become the accused uh, as the case would then go on uh, 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 in total. But how do you think the public, because a lot of people are now understanding that security is everybody's business. Uh, because everybody is affected when there's insecurity, as we have now seen. Um, how do you think it's best for the security agencies to draw the public nearer to them, uh, especially to get information out of them? Uh, you are an intelligence officer of many, many years, uh, and therefore I believe I'm asking the right person this kind of question. And what kind of information is useful uh, to security agencies who are looking for intelligence so that it's not just anything you see you go and talk but what exactly is it that is the kind of thing that could be of use you see for the police the police for instance you know is charged with uh, is a lead agency in maintenance of uh, internal security now what is the relationship of the people and the police, they look at police as we against them. So the police needs to begin to build that confidence, first of all, gain the confidence of the people to be able to volunteer information. You can deal with the senior officers if you think uh, you give uh, information to the junior officers, uh, it will be compromised. And not only that, they, they have dedicated lines. You don't need to be physically present. They have dedicated lines. The police has the dedicated lines. The SSS has dedicated lines. Even social media, you can send WhatsApp messages and all these things. But you see, the problem is that people want to settle scores with their, with their colleagues or friends. They give frivolous information at the end of it. You look at it nothing comes out of that investigation. So if you are sure of your investigation, like you see movement of people, you should be able to allow the security, I suspect and I see movement of people. There was a, a video that went viral recently that uh, on the road uh, between uh, local and uh, you saw more than 20 motorcycles carrying two, two persons. Incidentally, it turned out not to be Nigeria. So how do you rely on uh, not to be local there? So how do you rely on such information? Look at the issue of um, the shooting at uh, Zuba. It happened that night. And people brought out something around the desert, maybe a Zafara or anywhere, and say it was a Zuba. So when you give such information, how would the security agents, you are only diverting their attention. How would they take you serious? So look at what happened, uh, what affects us, and not only that, I advise that people should, you know, be able to have committees or security vigilantes to look at what is happening around them. If you go to Maitama, for instance, here in Abuja or Asokoro, you'll be surprised that the next person doesn't know his neighbor. So how do you reconcile that? How do you discuss uh, security within the environment? So what we need now is communal effort to ensure that uh, we, we come together, assist the police, get the police involved in such a vigilante group, 
get the approval, and uh, we will begin to make uh, progress. But if you sit down and say, it's not my business, it's the rest. eventually we will all suffer. When the roof crashes, it crashes on the head of all of us. So we must assist the second, no matter. But the agencies to have roles to play, to build confidence, gain the confidence of the people to also assist them. You earlier on uh, talked about Amotec, who has been, you know, easily uh, appearing to be the most organized of the regional uh, security groupings and, uh, and the effectiveness that they've brought to bear on the security situation in the South uh, uh, West. But other uh, regions in the country have also tried to uh, set up such uh, regional uh, groupings. In the Southeast, for example, you have uh, Bubeagu, uh, in the southeast, and then, uh, of course, you have a, a couple of others uh, in the various uh, states in uh, the north, sometimes uh, having a mixture of official uh, security forces and then vigilantes uh, and so on. How effective can this be, especially since we started the interview talking about coordinating the various activities so that uh, you are not duplicating people's efforts and you are not having abuses uh, of, of, of the authorities uh, given to these uh, uh, various groups. Uh, how is that, how do you think that is uh, to work, uh, especially because we have talked about the issue of coordination, intelligence coordination has been so critical? Well, you see, first of all, you know, I give you for Amoteku, uh, the regional security outfit, they were able to go through the houses of assembly and pass this uh, as law in the state establishing these bodies. So first of all, you cannot put something or nothing. They must be established by law. Where you heard of Ibubago, uh, 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 they launched it and that was the end. Nobody is doing anything about it. So I believe that they should resuscitate it, get them properly organized. And you see, I believe in experience. If it worked very well in the Southwest, why don't you send uh, people from the Southwest to look at uh, the structures and how it's operated in the Southwest? The same thing for South South. South South uh, muted the idea. I don't know what has come up. Apart from creating jobs for people, it's going to help you in your security. I've always, uh, I've always uh, uh, also emphasized on the need, though long term, of uh, establishment of the state police. Because if we don't restructure and have the state police or state police commands, this problem will continue to linger. The reasons are obvious. They know the environment, they know the terrain. A situation where you bring somebody from uh, Medugri and post to Yenegua and you carry Yenegua person and go to Sokoto, first of all, you have language barrier. You have cultural differences. You have religious differences. It's difficult for them to gain the confidence. If you go to the East, for instance, now, the impression is that, uh, if you go to Southeast, the impression is that the Northerners are being sent to the Southeast to extort money from the people, and that's what's going on. So you can, they cannot gain the confidence of the people. So I believe that we need to localize our police for us to make success out of all these various security challenges confronting the country. In terms of arms purchases, is another area of uh, the effort that a lot of people have talked about at Nigeria, as you've talked about earlier, that we need technology, but we need uh, 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 targeted technology to win this fight, and that we should be prepared uh, for the fact that this is not going to go away soon because this is asymmetrical warfare, and in other places in the world, it has never gone away uh, uh, so quickly. We should be prepared for the long haul. Give us a roadmap, if you like, about uh, what you think any government, uh, especially as we're approaching elections, the new government that is going to be in place in May next year, and even the government that is currently in place as it winds down, what kind of structure in terms of uh, 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 strengthening both the military and intelligence agencies, what are the kinds of things that they should be thinking about or doing, in fact, now? Yeah, I've uh, talked, I've uh, di actually discussed part of it, but if a uh, new government is coming in, I, I've, I'll look at the recruitment process of our various security agencies 
that have been politicized. So it makes them unprofessional now. So what I'm saying is that they should do the rigors. I've seen cases uh, do the rigors in recruitment. I've seen cases where National Assembly members will pose in a group photograph with uh, policemen and uh, other security agencies that they are recruited. Where do you think the loyalty of those people will, will go to? Of course, they go to the person that recommended them for employment and not the country. So we need to professionalize. We will need also to re-equip and reprioritize our funding of the security agencies. Everybody will be saying funding, funding, the money that has been given, what has it been done with? Not only to draw budgets, you must also monitor and audit what has happened to the money given to them. I was in a program yesterday in a town hall meeting, and I, was, uh, I had a, a friend there who is incidentally a member of National Assembly. And I pointed it out point, point blank that um, the National Assembly, in the bid of oversight, collect money. Monies are built in for them in the name of a community project. Otherwise, they don't get their budget approved. Corruption is another one. So government, the new government has to check it. Because the leadership of the various agencies, the little they get, they also try to corner someone. Can you explain how a general was seen with 600 million naira cash? How do you explain it in a sane society? And not only that, we also need to look at the budgeting. The budgeting in terms of that over 80% of the budget for the security agencies, or all over, is virtually 80% on recurrent. And you don't have 20%, uh, you have less than 20% on uh, capital. And with this capital, the little they do, they inflate the contracts, leaving nothing, uh, leaving nothing to be used in buying of uh, uh, the required arms. So I expect the National Assembly that in their oversight, they should be able to say, this was money budgeted to you. What and what have you bought with this? Let us see. But they will hide under the pretext that it's a security vote. You are not supposed to vet it. You are not supposed to do this. How long shall we continue like that? If we continue like that, there's no way we are going to make progress. So these are some of the issues I think should be looked into by the new government. Corruption mainly is the bane of our society, and it must be checked holistically. Do we need more boots on the ground, for example, in the intelligence agencies? Do you think we should employ more people on the ground? You can't. We need them, but you cannot employ without the necessary budget. Otherwise, you employ people you cannot afford to pay their salaries. The police, the president promised us 10,000 police a year, making 40,000. How many of them have been? There's a problem squabbling between the police service commission and police management. Have they been able to recruit? And if you recruit, where are you going to uh, get the salary if they are not budgeted for? So we need more boots on ground, but uh, they have to be budgeted for. Indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ejiofo, for your time uh, today. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you on this night. Thank you. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye.